Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Akil, and for today's episode, Stephanie Wong shares her personal journey of growth, learnings, and a transition into a more technical role over at Google Cloud. She's currently head of developer engagement, an award-winning speaker, engineer, as well as content creator, a dancer, and an advocate dog lover. Huh. I'll put the links to her socials in the description below, and with that being said, enjoy the episode. I always believe in, you know, telling your stories as openly as you possibly can. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with that. One of the things I, I saw when I researched you is you did a podcast and it was called Where the Internet Lives. And it, that goes into data centers and the people that work there. And for me at first, I was like a data center is a, it's a thing and that has like server racks and everything. I didn't think about anything that goes into that with regards to the security or the scale of the operation when I first started out. So throughout my career, I learned about that, but I'm really curious as to what you learned through doing that podcast and talking to those people. Oh gosh, that podcast was such a highlight in yeah. my career so far because I absolutely love this idea of physical infrastructure that underpins the internet and cloud. And so to be able to in investigate through the people who truly are supporting this physical infrastructure yeah. was such a great honor. And it opened the door to let me see truly how many people are involved in such an operation of scale, as well as the variety of roles that exist that people just simply do not know about, which is actually by design, right? Mm. You're not supposed to know when data centers are operating because the whole point is that they're happening smoothly behind the scenes. And if something goes wrong and you feel it or you notice it, then it's not doing its job. So to really get to a point where we're able to support that at a global scale for a company like Google, you have to imagine just how many people are involved along with the technology itself. Yep. So that podcast gave me the opportunity to hear their stories, but not just about the day-to-day -day job that they had, but about where they started, the, the countries that they were from, their educational um, environments, their family environments, the struggles and the triumphs that they had experienced to even get to a point of being a candidate for Google. So it's really, really interesting just to, from a host perspective to hear their stories um, really even just outside of the podcast. Yeah, yeah. I, I listened to one of the episodes and I think I'm absolutely going to listen to more of those because I picked up one on one of the things you said. It's when it's a smooth operation, no one notices anything about it, right? And the fact that I didn't think of, okay, what goes on behind the scenes is a fact that it is a smooth operation and it's going really great because you barely notice anything. The only thing you notice might be when everything is down and then that's a huge issue, but then I could only recount it happening once, which was like two years ago and I couldn't Google why Google or YouTube was down, which was quite interesting. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's a, there's a huge scale of operation going on there and I think it's just really cool that you got to, got to do that. Yeah, and we actually recently won a 2022 Webby Award for the podcast for Best Technology Podcast. And we also won the People's Voice Award, which was selected by um, the public. And so it just gave us this huge honor and like stamp of approval from <laughs> this body of judges as well as the public. And um, I think if anything that I got out of that was that these stories are interesting and they matter. And people are curious about not just data centers themselves, but the people who keep them running. And also exciting is that I think we're going to be working on a third season nice. of the podcast with me as the host. So you'll be hearing more from me there. <laughs> that sounds great. Congrats on the award. I actually didn't know that. Um, Thank you. You mentioned listening and learning from people and, and how they got to be here. That's kind of what I love on, on this show as well. So I'd love to know how you got to where you are because we spoke earlier in a in a pre-show setting and you mentioned you don't have a technical background either yeah that's true i've been talking a lot about that this week because mm. i came out with a video uh this week talking about a four-step process for people from non-traditional backgrounds or non-technical backgrounds to get into cloud and i'm hosting a twitter space tomorrow which by the time this airs might be in the past, but yeah. uh, it's also about the same topic from different influencers who have gone from being in uh, theater, acting, 
uh, dancing. For me, I you know I've been a dancer and a, and a pageant contestant, and um, made their way into engineering or cloud. So it's just been a huge theme that I have been advocating for in my career uh, because when I first joined DevRel, I was extremely intimidated and felt an immense sense of imposter syndrome mm. uh, because I didn't have a traditional background. I was never a self-taught developer or computer science major. So I really had to learn everything in the job um, and by doing all of this content. So I think it's just so important um, to be authentically yourself, not only because we want to increase the diversity uh, in engineering and in tech, but I also think it's important because it'll bring you much more fulfillment in your life in the end. If you're doing something that you enjoy, but you can be 100% yourself and use your interests outside of work to infuse what you do at work. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I agree with you that humans are multifaceted, right? There's different components and I usually say there's different versions of me, right? I'm, I might be grumpy in the afternoon or when I wake up or... I'm different at work. I'm different when I was a kid. I was different talking to friends and talking to my parents. There's different versions, but they're all you. They're all part of you. They're all the same you, just in different settings and in different contexts. And I think that's exactly true. If you can be your true self also at work, that will be more fulfilling than when it's just some version of you and you can't be your true self. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm also going to give a talk on imposter syndrome for women tech makers in a couple of weeks as well. And nice. I talk about, you know, not operating from a point of fear of being an imposter, but truly understanding um, the environment that you're in and why you are getting any sense of that. I think, especially for women, we often feel like we are comparing ourselves to the highlight reels of other people, especially if you don't see anyone that looks like you in your environment, in your career. Um, and so I'm all about moving past that because for me, I've gone through imposter syndrome pretty much in the biggest trans transitory moments or transitions in my career, um, going from school to my first job, going from my first job to my second job in cloud going from my first company to Google and then going from like sales engineering over to DevRel. Yep. So it's really natural, I guess, is the first point to make. And also, second of all, the people who feel imposter syndrome are usually the highest achievers. So it's like you got to kind of recognize that you're already doing much better than a lot of people. Yeah, yeah it's weird, right? The, the biggest critic usually is yourself. Because you're like, oh, I could have done better. I could have done this. I could have done X, Y, and Z. Uh, I could have not watched that Netflix show and actually put in an extra hour. And then other people would be like, man, you already work X amount of hours <laughs> after hours. Yeah, I'm 100% that person where <laughs> I feel guilty when I'm not working or being productive. And like my partner all the time is like, I don't think you actually know how to relax. Like yeah. you need to learn how to relax on the weekends and do it. So yeah, I'm absolutely that person. I'm guilty of that. But I also know that uh, I try to strike a good balance and always try to maintain a grounded mindset so I can just have more sustainable lifestyles yeah. moving forward. Yeah. Um, and that's why doing dance and pageants and extracurriculars outside of work is super important for me because it's like totally my outlet. Um, so I'm still on a dance team at Google. I still do stuff outside of work too. Yeah. I, I really like that you said it, it grounds you, right? If I think about myself, if I wouldn't have anything else, if I didn't go out with friends, if I didn't, uh, play my video games, if I didn't watch my YouTube on the side, uh, to relax, I would probably only be working. And I notice it, especially I live with my girlfriend. If she's not here, if she's in a different country because she lives in Italy and she's with her parents, I work overtime, I notice, because she's the person that grounds me the most and is like, hello, you've been staring at that screen for X amount of hours. You haven't even eaten anything. Um, so it's hard. You need those things or even those relationships to ground you because otherwise you'll probably burn out, yeah. Yeah. I mean, whether it's an activity or a person to pull you away from a screen, uh, you need something like even if it's reading a book or anything else. Um, but yeah, going back to your question, because you asked me what my background was or yeah. how I got into the position I am today. I went to university for communication studies. So if people ask me if I have a CS degree, I tell them, yes, technically you're right. 
but it's computer communication studies, not CS. <laughs> um, and so uh, I love making that joke because, yeah, I just it's it's just become a part of who I am. I've always been passionate about communication. And I did a ma- minor in digital humanities, which was a new field at the time, which allowed me to get an introduction to information systems, internet concepts, um, and do some analytics related to social media and current events. Okay. So that kind of gave me the edge to get my first job in tech. But prior to that, I didn't really know what direction I wanted to take. So I ended up doing a bunch of internships in the entertainment industry because I had always been passionate about uh, video production and media. Nice. So I did internships for Warner Brother Records, which is a music a label. I also did some YouTube channel internships uh, that involved dance. Uh, and I did one at one small tech company as well. So like many people, I had no idea what I wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, just experimented because that's the only way to find out, right? Yeah. Uh, it wasn't until I started my job hunt that I ended up uh, applying to Oracle for my first job as a sales engineer, which I had no idea what, what that meant. But I did assume that it had something to do with doing business as well as engineering. Yeah. And it seemed like a pretty good fit given I had some analytics experience and some information systems experience, but also communications. So I gave it a go because I had always grown up in Silicon Valley knowing that Oracle was a pretty big name. Yeah. Uh, and they were offering training for entry level positions. And I thought, you know, along with my parents, we thought that that was a great foundation to start your career with. And they were right. So I'd go ahead. I went ahead and did that um, and was in that role for a year and a half, learned a bunch about how to work with clients and how to be a technical counterpart and kind of a consultant. Um, and then after that, I decided to transition into cloud because I felt like it was a big industry mover. Um, a lot of conversations would gear themselves towards cloud. Yeah. So I ended up joining customer success team at Oracle, which was the first one um, that was post sales to help onboard customers and uh, get them to use the products. So I became a lot more hands on. And instead of focusing on analytics, I moved to focus on cloud platform and infrastructure as a service, um, which again, gave me more experience in some more technical concepts. Now, this whole time, I'm still questioning whether it's sales engineering and post-sales customer success is the right role for me. So I'm also applying to grad school, thinking that I might go back into journalism um, or try out journalism, yeah. and only to realize that uh, it wasn't really feeling right and it wasn't sticking for me. So I dropped out of that um, approach and decided to continue just gaining experience and taking off time to travel. Yeah. Um, and at that point, I had already tried to apply to Google most multiple times because it was a dream company of mine, but they just never, they rejected me every time. Yeah. So I kind of let that, you know, it's fine. They ended up reaching back out at, after three years of me working in the industry oh, wow. to ask me if I wanted to be a sales representative at Google Cloud. Interesting. Which, which is great, but it just wasn't the role that I wanted to do because I wanted to maintain some of my technical skills and, um, you know, maintain sales engineering. So I decided to just do the interview anyway as a learning process. I got the offer and then I made the difficult decision to actually turn down the offer from this company that I had been trying to get a job at for years, yeah. even as a receptionist. And um, Way to stick yeah, to your guns. Hard... Yeah. Oh, I talked to tons of people like my parents and friends and coworkers and yeah, everyone gave me mixed answers. So I ultimately decided to just follow my intuition. Yeah and turned it down. And it ended up being a great choice because three months later, they reached back out about a sales engineering position that opened up. Yep. And they said, all the interviews you did count. You did great in them, but we're just going to have you do several other technical interviews. So I did that and really worked my butt off for those interviews and ended up getting the job. Um, I cut my travel short and joined Google Cloud from there. So I will stop there because there's a whole nother story <laughs> relating to how I transitioned to DevRel. But yeah, yeah it was an unexpected um, path to both the position and the industry that I wasn't really uh, expecting from the start. Yeah, it's it's weird how you, I think how we all sometimes end up where we don't really expect we'll end up, especially when you look back. Um, but there's multiple things that I really love that you laid out. 
first one is you want to experience things, right? You can read upon things, you can read a book or listen to a podcast, but the way to truly know if something is for you is by experiencing. And joining a first position where you can experience as much of that as you think you need is a great choice, I think. Through that, you'll learn, okay, this is for me. And even by learning this is not for me, that is also information, right? And you'll move towards where you'll eventually end up. And you're, I don't even know if this is going to be where you're going to be for the next X, Y, Z years. But eventually you'll move on. You'll be like, okay, I've done this. I'm going to move to this now. I'm going to try things out. Experiencing is, I think, the best way to learn at the end of the day. I'm not saying reading or listening to podcasts is not great. I think it is great. Inform yourself, but do experience and do try out those things, especially where there's a chance at an opportunity. You can still stick to your guns like you did and say, okay, this is not for me. Um, or jump in and be like, okay, we're going to do this now and see how it is. Really cool. Yeah, exactly. I struggled a lot with this myth that you have to find your passion mm. or because there's a saying, if you find your passion, you'll never work a day in your life. Yep. And I think I over-indexed on that a little bit too much out of college because I was looking for a sense of normalcy, a path, certainty yep. in a time where it's going to be ambiguous for everyone unless you're on a, on a path to being a doctor or a lawyer, right? So I just kept searching for answers. And of course, looking back on it, I'm like, how would I have known what my passion was if I only experienced like 21 years of my life at that point? Yeah. I, there's so much more in the world to offer. But of course, I was I was young and I didn't have that perspective back then. Looking back on it, I always tell people now that the best way to find a passion is A, of course, experience new things, try new things. And you might be surprised that a passion might emerge from you trying these things. And the more you add effort to a certain area, yep. the more that you may find that this passion and this interest starts to harden and really crystallize in your life. Um, and that's what's happened to me as a result of creating content and telling stories. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So when you joined either your, your first uh, position or your transition into Google, right, there's always multiple things I look at for my personal job and for my personal environment, it's the people I'm doing it with, it's the thing that I'm doing, it's the future career that the company might have or actually how much of an impact we're having. Which one of those facets like count it really uh, towards your own decisions in that? I think transitioning into Google, some of, and I've actually gone through this exercise before yeah. when I was deciding on, uh, you know, jobs and grad school. I remember one of my mentors was like, if you had to rank all these things like mission, sense of responsibility, um, you know, what the company stood for or, you know, how, how much you're going to learn in the role. There's a lot. I rank them. Yeah. And at that point in my life, I realized that learning was the most important, like learning, maybe the, the company product or the mission. And then, you know, down the line, it would be like sense of responsibility, et cetera, or yeah. like money. But learning was extremely important and it still is today for me. Um, I think at, at Google, what I wanted to get the most out of it was the ability to learn. And I knew that I was, I would be surrounded by talented people from some of the best, um, other companies in the world. It's yeah. like this curation of these extremely successful people in, in, um, across all fields. And so the key thing for me was to dive into an environment where there wasn't as much red tape as there was in some of the other environments I've been in, where I could easily cross boundaries, work cross-functionally, share ideas through like really just osmosis across the organization nice, and not feel like I was bound by any conventional means or ideas. And I felt like Google gave me a lot of that flexibility and freedom to learn and quench my thirst for curiosity, but also provide really great structure in place from an organizational standpoint. Like you get freedom, but you get the guardrails, the structure and the resources available of a large company. Okay. So that was what attracted me there. What, what do you mean by kind of structure? Because I have a hard time imagining that. For me, too much structure would mean I can't go as fast. Uh, and I love being able to put an idea into practice, right? Sure, I have to I have to have had challenged my idea by a few people. 
Uh, but at some point, I do want to put it into practice. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a healthy amount of structure that's good. I think that, you know, to get to a size of company that Google is at, they had to have implemented structure in process for not only pushing out products, but yep. also in operations, in employee relations and collaborative um, ways of collaboration, communication. Um, they have all of their HR systems in place. They have all of their work streams in place. They have their engineering best practices. They have some of the best ways of achieving a high level of like SLA, SLO for the own company to operate. Yeah. So I I think that it's it's a good place to understand guidelines on how to achieve some of those levels that you can take with you elsewhere. And yeah. so that's kind of why I've stuck at a big company so far. Because if I decide to go to a smaller company where you get even more freedom in some ways, and less structure in other ways, at least you, you walk away from your experience at a big company having learned some of those things. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. If we move back into kind of your personal journey, the things I, I hold a lot of value in is the, the relationships I create along the way. And I think I'm really lucky that I had good mentorship, good guidance, um, and good leadership, at least. My direct manager, I was usually really happy with because they, they made sure to open the doors for me. If I was like, okay, I'm happy with what I got, give me more responsibilities, I wanna move into that one. Uh, I wanna try things out with regards to databases, infrastructure, network, because I started out in operations. They would open those doors, either make those introductions or be like, do you want me to make those introductions or do you wanna do it yourself? They would always give me options and a way to move forward a path towards what I wanted to grow. And I really am really grateful for that. So I'm wondering, what, what was your experience with that kind of leadership or guidance? I feel like I've been so fortunate in my career because I haven't had a blatantly negative experience with mm. managers or, or um, you know, people that I look up to. So I think I've been really lucky that in my first job, you know, if at worst I had an apathetic manager, but at best, you know, and the next manager I had, they were great you know they were they weren't like the best manager ever but you know they were helpful um but yeah i think there are key players in my life that have really enabled me one of them going back to even just in high school i had a mentor that had encouraged me to apply to universities that were way outside of my league i thought mm. and encouraged me to continue to keep doing those standardized testing to get a better score to put the work in to get to write an even better personal statement to apply to these schools. And in the end, I didn't actually get into any of those far reaching stretch goal schools, but, and I was crushed, but at the same time, it taught me that you don't really, you miss every shot that you don't take, yep. right? It's better that you go for the shot than to not at all. Um, so that's what I took away from that. And I still really cherish that relationship that I built with that mentor at such an early age. Um, and then nowadays, I mean, my current manager at my team has been by far one of the best coaches I've had because he, along with um, my skip level, have both opened up doors just in the same way mm. and have been true sponsors where if they're in a room with another manager where they ask, where they're talking about, hey, we want to find someone who is going to be this person to build a relationship with marketing, to be the voice of the company, to be the voice for developers you know, my skip level was the one who put my name in the hat. Yeah. And if it weren't for that opportunity, then, you know, I would have missed out on the last year and a half of all these leadership opportunities I've had, as well as the relationships that I've built with product management, engineering, and marketing. So that really, really helped propel the trajectory of my career. If he were in the room, he'd probably say, well, I wouldn't have said that unless you put the hard work in and you, <laughs> you really, you know, allowed yourself to be that, that candidate. But yeah. I, it's just that kind of great relationship that we've built that is so fruitful in the end. Yeah. Um, but my manager has also just um, really taught me a lot about creating technical artifacts that will help you in your career, how to tell your own story for performance reviews to get good ratings and to you know, build up yourself in your career. Um, and then behind closed doors, when he's talking to other managers about my performance, he's always fighting for me too. Hmm. So it's those it's it's what happens when you're not there that proves to be really really helpful and pivotal in your career yeah you mentioned a skip a skip level i hadn't heard that term yet what, what is that 
Oh, skip level is the person that your manager reports to. Oh, in that way. So the so it's manager's like manager. Skip level. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Yeah. Out of, out of the qualities then of your of your skip level or your manager, what what do you think makes them good leaders? Is it they really listen and, and fight for you and believe in you, or or what do you think makes them good managers with regards to other managers that you've had? I think that they practice this style of leadership that's service-oriented leadership. Mm. They are not self-serving. They are there to build up their teams. And by enabling their teams, they can enable themselves in a sense, right? Yeah. So I think that they're really in it to coach other people and see their own reports succeed. And my manager has always said to me, one day I'm going to be reporting to you. <laughs> and it's this kind of message that it's it's – a joke somewhat, but it's like, it's just, you get so much meaning out of that kind of statement because you know that they're really in it to, um, set you up for success and to make sure that you're happy in the role and that you're doing your best work and you feel excited to come in every day. So I think that this style of leadership has left such a big imprint on me because I'm going to take so much out of this experience. So when I manage a team, I will practice that level of empathy, that level of advocacy, and that level of service-oriented leadership for others. Yeah, and pay it forward, right? I This morning I had a thought. I was like, whatever, because I, I move a lot from environment to environment. And one of my mantras is I try to make it or leave it better as when I came in. Uh, so whatever I do, as long as I go away and it's better, I'm I'm happy, right? Because you don't want to come in make it worse, and then leave, right? That would be the worst feeling, at least for me personally. And if everyone does that, then everything should get better step by step, right? The only factors then that you have is external factors, which are mostly not people-related, right? Like right, the environment, right time, right place, context, stuff like that. And it, it really made it click when you said, okay, when I am in that position or when I will be in that position or I might not be in that position, but I have a conversation like that, I will pay it forward in that way as well. That's really cool. Yeah. And the other thing that they've always said to us is that if we take anything out of our experience on this team, it's that we walk away feeling like we've gotten something out of it. We we feel like we've grown from our experience on this team because I, this is one distinction that they make very clear. It's that they don't just think that you're going to leave the team one day or hope that you won't leave the team one day is that they expect you to leave the team one day and that yeah. you will to use it as a stepping stone to get into the next position that you want to be in. And so they have always underscored the importance of us being able to walk away from our experience on that team having grown. Yeah. And so it's that kind of culture that they've built that is a non-negotiable for them. And I think it's just imperative for every leader to truly understand the importance of that. Yeah, that, that's something I haven't seen everywhere. That people are like, we expect you to leave because this is a, a step in your career, right? You need to move forward or we expect you to grow. If you're not growing, then something's wrong, right? Do you not want to grow? Do you not want to get better at whatever you're doing? Do you not want to experiment and try things out? Then something is missing or you, you have the lack of drive, I guess. I've never experienced that. But the expectation yeah. that someone moves on from what they're currently doing, I think that's very healthy. Yeah, I haven't seen it everywhere. Yeah, I mean, it's not surprising that you haven't seen it everywhere because at the end of the day, when you're working somewhere and you may be a leader somewhere, it's still a business. You have to operate a business. You're responsible for a team that yeah. has expected outputs. So a lot of leaders don't have the uh, liberty of being able to say that in all cases. I think it's it's a really amazing aspiration to have. Yeah. And I think it's really important. But I think there's a lot of pressure coming from below, from your employees, and also coming from above to deliver outputs. And so it's easier said than done to make yep. that kind of culture, maintain that kind of culture. I get that. But that if that strain is there from from kind of an upper echelon or an upper management layer, that strain kind of trickles down, right? Throughout the management layer, throughout the hierarchy that you have. One of the things I always loved in, in whatever I had was transparency. I it blew my mind when I joined a company and they were like, okay, these are the net profit statements of this month and uh, these is the, this is the billability or the average billability. Like all that information was available in a presentation. I didn't ask for it. 
And then it was like, if you want more information, full transparency, just ask whatever you need or whatever you're interested in. Because you might not even need that information. You might just be curious. And I have a very curious mind, so I asked everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, transparency is another one that I didn't even mention, but it's uh, it's refreshing once you have it. Yeah, I think that's something else that I've really cherished on this team is the transparency from the management and just across the team in general. Because, you know, like I think there's a lot of generalizations that a lot of managers can say to you to protect themselves and to, you know, keep the status quo and keep everything as is. But it's really nice when you do have uh, managers and coaches who can just tell it like it is and say, you know, you know, overall, they're supposed to be what our managers sometimes say is like the the shit umbrella. Mm-hmm. They're supposed to be like the BS umbrella. They umbrella you and shield you from a lot of the political stuff that happens to make sure that you can focus on your best work. And they just let a little bit trickle in. So you kind of understand the the state of the union, right? You kind of understand what's happening just enough to, you know, be on edge a bit. Yeah. But um overall like having the transparency to tell you like what's happening this is this current status this is where you need to improve this is um how the company and the team is doing like that's tremendously helpful um in feeling like you're safe on the team in some ways and just like psychologically safe yeah yeah absolutely absolutely i had a thought but i lost it you mentioned earlier uh a thing about experiencing imposter syndrome and i have a very distinct memory it was i was probably like 22 i was very early on in career and i had automated like a part of the business and i went to a colleague and i said Look, listen we normally have this procedure we do this we don't have to do it anymore because this is the underlying cause and we fix that and they insisted on continuing with that process to a point where i pushed back i, I tried to explain my words again and sure it was probably late friday afternoon and, and a lot of factors happened there but they lashed out on me i got yelled at And I had never experienced something like that before. And then I was like, okay. I looked to the other colleagues because a lot of people had already gone home. A lot of feedback there. When when the colleague went away, I asked. I was like, did I do anything wrong? Uh, No, they were like, it was completely fine. It's probably not your fault. But then over the weekend, I went inward. I was like, should I have seen something differently? Should I have done something differently? To the point where I had to talk to my manager and be like, listen, I don't want to be in an environment where someone can just yell at someone else, right? Sure, context matters, but that's not how I want to work with someone else. Uh, So we had a conversation and we put it behind us. But that's truly when I was like, okay, something. I made a mistake. This is all me. This is all my fault. And I should have handled it differently. Well, the problem was probably either in the middle um, or it was a different issue, right? It wasn't about that. It was something else. But that really made me reflect and be like, okay, do I actually belong in this space or is this not for me? Yeah. I mean, it's good to recognize that, you know, the environment that you're in and whether you align with the culture that is around you. Yeah. Um, Because it's hard. Like when you, especially on a team like mine, where um, just to kind of touch on how I joined this team, I was creating content on Google Cloud uh, on the side as a 20, like not even 20% officially. It was just kind of me doing it for fun after I met someone on the floor as a sales engineer. Nice. And so we started, you know, tinkering with cameras, creating videos, doing demos until we got noticed by uh, some folks in DevRel who asked us to do it officially for the Google Cloud tech channel. And so that's how I started uh, building that relationship and getting more opportunities and to a point where I met the director and he asked me to you know, kind of join, uh, see if I was interested in joining this team. So we started chartering this team, me and my current teammates, um, like Priyanka, you know, started chartering this brand new team of content creators for technical content. Um, And so we were able to build the culture to what it is today and operate off a culture of, yeah, transparency, um, respect, great collaboration, um, really embracing reality as things are. Um, and so now that we're at a team of, you know, over 15 people, um, in this direct immediate team with every addition to the team, it's really hard to maintain culture because you want to make sure that every single person is living up to the values that you've already set out for since the beginning. Exactly. Um, culture is not something that comes from top down. It's important that it comes from top down, of course, right. To set a precedence, but every single person is responsible for 
maintaining that culture as well. Yeah, it's kind of a, it's kind of clay, I guess. And you add piece by piece and it, it kind of morphs into a different set of culture or it adds to it or I don't know if it ever subtracts to it. Maybe if someone goes away, uh, but it always keeps evolving, right? And if you've kind of molded it and you're happy with it, you need to figure out maybe a puzzle is better, uh, but you need to figure out if it actually molds together in the way that you think it should. Yeah, exactly. And like, what do you do if there is a bad apple? Like, what if you, what do you do if, if it's a, just a really difficult time on the team, like the yep. pandemic and maybe some, some, some people are being super negative or do you like offer and extend your help? Do you, do you like all these changing in situations really uh, affect both the individuals and the culture? And as a leader on the team, not even as an official manager, but just a yeah. leader on the team, you bear the responsibility of how to, um, you know, be an addition and not a subtraction. Yeah, exactly. I remember because we were talking about growth earlier and kind of leadership. You've transitioned from uh, where you started to where you are now, right? And in there, you've grew, grown to what you're doing now. I'm wondering what, what have you learned that works for you when it comes to kind of personal growth, either in the past or, or even the things that you're doing now? Oh, that's such a broad question because <laughs> I feel like uh, I've had a lot of personal growth in a, many different areas. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if I mentioned this yet, but I actually am a dancer outside of work and I also competed in pageants yeah. as well. And so I think I've had a lot of personal growth both in those environments and at work. And I think they're actually very interconnected as parts of who I am. Yeah. Being a dancer has allowed me to express myself since I was three. I've always been a performer at heart. And and pageants was a newer thing once I started working that I just wanted to try for fun to get closer to my heritage because it was related to Chinese culture. And after winning and becoming a part of that community more, I met so many amazing people and lifelong pr friends and really learned how to be confident on stage and speak on stage and again, perform and be this like ambassador and leader in my community. Awesome. And then when I was in technology, you know, I really started as someone who knew nothing on the floor to learning everything while doing the job, um, going from absolutely zero technical experience to finding this great niche of an area where I can be technical and build solutions, but also create content and write stories about it for developers. And so I think a lot of the personal growth has just been finding my voice yeah. in the area and being confident in that voice and being a thought leader in the space, in the industry as a whole, finding my creative outputs and which parts of the process I like. Um, everybody on the team has their own ways of creating content. And I think what I really enjoy most at this point is being able to tell other people's stories or stories about the technology and the people who make them just like that data center podcast. Yeah. But I've also done stuff like the da a data center video where I got to tour a data center and show the layers of physical security, Nice. Um, which did super well and also won a Webby award last year. Um, but I also created a video about subsea cables and how subsea cables and terrestrial cable networks support um, the amount of um, scale and, and um, speed that you experience in cloud um, as well. So yeah, I just have this like fascination and I've been able to learn how to uh, both represent myself through communication, but take a small idea and work through a ton of amb ambiguity to make it a reality in visual form. Uh, yeah. And that takes working with a lot of people from many different teams. Yeah, I can imagine you start out with, probably when you started out, you had a certain vision on, on how you expected things to go. But I'm imagining that vision has grown and you really now have kind of a step on the horizon of, okay, I think this is where it should be. And you work towards that. Do you think, because you're now head of developer engagement, I think, if I remember that correctly, do you think you'll always do this? Because what you explained is so broad, right? If you're interested in a certain topic, you go ahead and do that. Create content with regards to that. Educate engineers for that. Um, are you ever going to stop doing that and move to a next thing? Uh, I don't, I never speak in absolute. So no. absolutely, I'm going to do other things. Uh, and that's like actually a big question because I don't know my five-year plan because five years ago, I didn't even think I was going to be in this role yeah. because it didn't exist. So <laughs> it's just proof that five-year plans are 
great, but also maybe an obsolete way of planning your life out. Um, I always wonder what I'm going to do next. I love what I do now. Absolutely. But I have so many interests and experiences to be had. And so I fully expect myself to be doing something totally different in my career or maybe even five things. Like I, I love the idea that you, you don't, you don't need to have one career in your life. Uh, gone are the days of me thinking that I needed to find one passion in my life. And I'm fully comfortable with taking risks and trying out new things, whether it be going into venture capital, working with startups to help support them, or becoming a broadcast host for um, news about technology. Who knows? I think that's the beautiful thing about this role is that I can take it any direction I want. Um, but that's also the beautiful thing about life. Um, you know, I think you know, you might be getting in your own way. I think uh, people can really make their, this is cliche, but they can make their own realities by taking those risks. Yeah, I I agree. It might sound cliche, but it is something I fully stand behind that. I, I love that answer. I usually cannot make a five-year plan. I always struggle with that because it is dynamic, right? You, you're going to set a plan and sure the act of planning might be helpful, but at some point you're going to be like, okay, we're absolutely going to deviate from this plan. Because five years is just yeah. way too much ahead in the future. So. Yeah, it's always great to have a plan, um, keep a, a eye on the prize, but to be flexible enough to deviate from the plan and adapt. And that is a huge, huge learning in my life that has really um, positioned me well for pivoting and being adaptive. So I think it's a really good quality to have. Yeah, yeah, 100% agreed. Thank you for coming on, Stephanie. I really enjoyed learning about your journey and kind of your learnings along the way as well. Thank you for coming on and sharing. And Thank uh, you so much. Oh, sorry. No, no worries. <laughs> I was going to round it off there. Was there anything that's still kind of left on the table you wanted to share? Well, I love connecting with people and sharing and hearing their stories. So reach out to me, connect with me on Twitter at Steph R underscore Wong and or on my website stephrwong.com and yep. i'm looking to actually create more short form content on tiktok etc about some of these professional learnings that i've been able to have throughout the years so stay tuned for more on that yeah love hearing that i'm gonna put all the links to stephanie's socials in the description below stephanie wong check her out and with that being said thanks for listening we'll see you on the next one